bifurcation happens at one, the bifurcation to a, a stable point that's not zero. You see, as you adjust R, you're raising the height of this. I don't know why, yeah, there we go. Raising the height. Here is 2.8, just the first thing around 2.8, first parameter value that we looked at. This will allow you to plot some orbit and it uses the rules of a cobweb diagram. So if I start at X not equals 0.1, this just follows the cobweb diagram and you see it's overshooting, but it gets to that fixed point that seems to be spiraling into a fixed point. This also allows you to try some different initial condition. Like, well, what if I want to be over here? Do I get anywhere else if I start somewhere else? Well, no, no, you end up at the same place. You just have a different approach to it. And this dynamically changes things as I go, you know, I pass through at three, you could see it seems to be going on to an attractor. This, if you get rid of showing the transient and just show the attractor, what the algorithm is doing is it's not looking at like the first 20 orbits or hundred orbits or whatever it is. It's only showing what it seems to be settling down to after a long period of time. And so this is jumping between two points. So jumping between two points is gonna appear as a square in the cobweb diagram. And you can, it shows the transient. Maybe it's easier if we show it in green, get rid of orbit one. And it just, you know, wherever I start, I will end up there. I could, it either spirals out to it or it spirals into it. Of course, because it's a map, it's kind of weird to try to interpret, but there it is. Okay, what about roughly 3.3? So this is starting from some initial condition, random in initial condition. It's hard to see, maybe. You could see again, period two. Ooh, I like red, red better. What about 3. Point? So it's just showing the attractor. You notice after R2, so at 3.5, now we're on a period four orbit. And period four, uh, it's really hard unless I really just slightly adjust this to see period eight. You see what a period eight orbit looks like. And if you want, here it is starting with any initial condition. How are things settling down to that from anywhere? Anywhere. That's some cool stuff. Get rid of the transient. That's the attractor. So this is period eight. We're getting really close to that R infinity. Yeah, this is definitely in the chaotic regime now. So it's, it's calling this an attractor, but it would be different if I start with a different initial condition. It's just, it's, it's, it's chaotic. If I get to where the period three is, period three was around 3.82 something. Down here, I'm trying to just barely adjust this. Whoa, what do you know? There's a periodic window. So this is a period three orbit. It's going between those, those three points along the diagonal line. The online tool that I found, online simulator, is.gd logistic map, and you can do your own. I wanted to be clear what this diagram is showing. This diagram is supposed to be showing you start with one initial condition, think of it some particular value of R. You start with a bunch of initial conditions, or maybe one, but let's just say a bunch of initial conditions. You follow them forward in time and find out where they settle down. And where they settle down is going to be that one point, the fixed point, the attractor. The same thing would happen if you started here with a bunch of initial conditions. What you'll find is that it'll settle down to just jump bouncing between those two points. Then when you do it in one of these chaotic things, you know, throw out the first thousand iterates and then keep the next thousand. <laughs> and what you'll see is just, what looks like a continuous set of points. It'll look like a kind of a scattershot pattern. There is a video that's useful to look at. So this is showing that map kind of being made iterate by iterate. Right, we're starting with all these points are just in initial conditions. And they're being followed in time until they, you know, where are they end, ending up? They're ending up following that thing that I sketched. You could see this period doubling over to the right in the kind of chaotic regions. If you want another view that's just more pixelated, there it is. It kind of looks like the, the chaotic parts are seething, but it just means things are kind of changing. I think I can show some more about the diagram. So here's an actual bifurcation diagram. Well, not actually, it's numerically calculated. Looks better than my hand-drawn thing. Like most of it's boring. So this is R, 
and this is Xn on the attractor. Before R equals one, the only attractor is, is zero. And then you get this branching. We call this R1, and then somewhere over here is R2. And then wherever, right, wherever this is happening, R3. The window of where the period three shows up is right there. But you can see there's, there's other windows. In fact, if we were to zoom in on this region down here, hopefully you could see that, just this region, and then plot that. This is that boxed region. This is just from here. You zoom in on it. Notice this only goes from 0.13 to 0.18 roughly, but we're in this region of R, very small. But what you see is something that looks like the copy of the larger image. So you have a copy. This sort of screams fractal, right? You, you zoom in on something and it shows what looks like the same structure, but at a smaller scale. In fact, there's the same sort of thing. These come together. And this is just one part of the period three, right? The, the other parts are, are, if I were to highlight them up here and here. So this is just one branch of the period three. And that one branch of the period three, that does a period doubling, which leads to, this is actually a period six. And then that doubles. And so you get period four times three, 12, period 12. Yeah. And then more and more, it, it does this period doubling cascade occurs again. That's what it's called. And anywhere you were to look, if, so if we looked now there and zoomed it, zoomed in, we'd see the same structure, but on the, a smaller scale. Are there any comments or questions about this structure before I try to say some more about trying to de derive the first few RNs? Anything? You say about the dark blue lines in the chaos region. Yeah, because uh, you might wonder, are those, are those real or are those artifacts? They are real. They're called super tracks. They are real. Let me go back to this diagram. They have to, something to do with the probability distribution. So if you were to look at where points just follow any initial condition and where does it tend to spend its time, you will find that, so if I say did a transect along here and then just plotted the probability distribution of X and here's the probability. Think of it as a histogram. There's going to be places where it's, it's zero and then there's these peaks and that's where there's these dark regions. They seem to form kind of interesting patterns. The super tracks, the dark regions, regions of a bunch of points are real and they are the regions of high probability. Because you might say, well, what if I, instead of throwing out the first thousand points, if I throw out the first 10,000, would those things go away? No, because points will just keep visiting these high probability regions over and over again. And the probability, if you look at a curve like this, the probability at a place where it's just periodic, you, you basically have delta functions of equal height. So yeah, those are real. They have something to do with if you look up the term invariant measure, it's kind of related to probability. So good question. People have also looked at this question of, suppose you pick a random, uh, even in this region, let's say, suppose you pick a random value of R, what's the probability you're in a chaotic region or a periodic window? And I don't know the answer, but people have worked on this. And if, you're, if you keep zooming in, there are periodic windows everywhere. There's a non-zero probability of getting each. So it's not like these things that we're showing as chaotic are really just periodic of really high period. They are chaotic. So that's the diagram. Veritasium does some great videos. And I think one of them is about this equation. Like this will make you think differently about the world and makes connections with Mendelbrot sets, which hopefully we'll get to fractals. Let me see if there's any other cool animations I had. It's not showing what the value of R is. It's just showing the initial condition. And as you adjust R, what you get for these time series, right? It looks periodic. And then the stuff that looks like a chaotic time series is, is probably in one of those regions of chaos. But it's also true you could find parameter values where the attractor is a period N for any N. I want to give you some idea of why you see the same structure on a smaller scale. 
And we'll just focus on this period three window. Even though it's, it's everywhere, like in any little window, if I were to zoom in, like I can't, but there'd be a little window there and you'd see the same thing. But it's easiest to understand looking at the period three window. This is showing F. You could also look at F with F. So that means two iterates of the map F three. Now, why would we want to look at that? If we have a period three point, so going back to here, period three points are those such that right, x n plus three equals x n. But you could also see them as any of the three, and maybe we'll call them q, p, l. So we'd say like p is f of q and L is F of P and Q is F of L. So you can see it's going between these three points. Think of it maybe this way, Q, P, L. I don't, I don't know if it's going exactly in this order, but so P is the iterate, L is the iterate of P and then Q is the iterate of L, something like that. But you could also view any of them, any of the three, are fixed points of three iterates of, of f. So by three iterates of f, this means f of f of f. Sometimes people write this this way, f composed with f composed with f. So all of these, q is a, if we define this as a new map, and it's just three iterates of f, q is a fixed point of f, which is just f, little f, raised to the third power. And same for p and l. So that means we could, instead of looking at the map, little f, we could look at the map of f composed with itself three times. And that's what I want to show you in this little simulation here. So I've chosen to show just f composed with itself three times. We can adjust r. And so now we're, we're kind of getting near r infinity and there's nothing significant happens there, but we did say the bifurcation happened under 3.82 where a period three orbit shows up. And if you notice what's happening, there's gonna be three simultaneous intersections. So three simultaneous tangencies of this curve with the diagonal line. You could see it most easily at the thing near between 0.9 and one. So up at the upper right, as I get, and it's hard to maneuver this, it's getting closer and closer, but notice the other two, one right in the middle around 0.5 and the other one down here between 0.1 and 0.2. Those are going to be tangent at 3.82. So whatever this value is. So there's the tangency. And that's when the period three orbit is born. So out of a chaotic window, you have a period three orbit. But just notice what happens as I increase R a little bit above that. Maybe it's better if I zoom in here. And this isn't giving the best resolution, but what do you see? You see what looks like a parabola that's rising above this diagonal line. And as you increase R, the parabola is getting higher and higher. So in some sense, this looks like the logistic map so if you see what I'm getting at, it means that if we, have a, if we have a little copy of the logistic map right there, then we will tend to see a, a little copy of all of the bifurcations that occur. I mean, that's heuristic, but that helps at least give some understanding of what's going on. For R slightly above the period three bifurcation, F of three looks like a small copy and behaves like a small copy in the sense that it's a parabola that's increasing in height as we change R, a small copy of the logistic map. And so we could argue then, then this is what leads to the self-similar bifurcation diagram. But that's just a sort of thumbnail sketch. There's other arguments that could be made, but hopefully that gives you some flavor for it. So we'll do more analyzing maps next time and some things about the generalities uh, related to bifurcation diagrams. Some explanation for this mysterious number, 4.6692. It, it ended up being a, it's like a new universal constant.
and it's it's just related to math, but you can see it in real world experiments. This isn't, of course, a real world experiment, but it's been seen and measured in real world experiments. So it's this sort of new thing related to uh, self-similarity and all of that. <laughs>